Greetings from the great state of Alaska. My name is Dr. G, and today I want to share with you a message of hope. We're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 76 today. This psalm is written by Asaph, the worship director, and it's titled A Psalm of Asaph, a song. And so we're going to start right at verse 1. We're going to go through the whole chapter today. Psalm chapter 76, verse 1. It says, In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. You know, this first verse, it's, it's bursting at the seams in terms of information. God is known in Judah. That's just a few words, but the fact that God is known, it means that God is knowable. You can know God. And he was known in Judah. He was, wasn't just known, he was accessible. You see, God is near, and he's willing to reveal himself to a people who are desperate to know him. And so if we look at the patriarchs, let's look at Abraham and Moses, for instance. We discover men who were intent on knowing God. They realized that God was knowable. God had revealed himself to these men. These were men who pursued God, and they knew God. And in turn, God knew these men. Matter of fact, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 11, the Bible says the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. That's a powerful verse. That says a lot about Moses. And it says a lot about God. And then if we go to Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, the Bible says, But you, O Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. And so there, in these two verses, we see Moses was God's friend, Abraham was God's friend. These two men had an intimate relationship with the God of the universe. God is known in Judah. His name is great in Israel. So God was known by Abraham, he was known by Moses, and this resulted in a deep friendship. And the good news for you and I is that today it's the same God. God is still knowable. He was known in Judah by many people. He had many friends. I'm sure outside of Abraham and Moses, God had many friends. And we know that Israel, they were God's chosen people. We know that God chose to reveal himself to Israel, to make himself known to the Jewish people. And God has spoken in these last days, has revealed himself to us through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. It talks about this in the book of Hebrews. So if we look at verse 2, Psalm chapter 76, verse 2, it says, His tent is in Salem, his dwelling place in Zion. This is talking about God. His tent is in Salem, his dwelling place in Zion. You see, God pitched his tent in Jerusalem, and he established Zion as his, let's say, his center of operations. Because that word for dwelling place is kind of like a military center or, or a, uh, the center of operations for, for strategy, you might say. And so the name Jerusalem, if we look at that name, it means foundation of peace. Jerusalem means foundation of peace. And, and that's fitting since God has revealed himself, and especially if we look at Gideon in Judges chapter 6, verse 24, God revealed himself to Gideon as Jehovah Shalom, which means God our peace. And so for sure, God is our peace. In fact, Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. But you have to understand that peace is ultimately the result of God's victory. Peace is the result of God's victory. Okay, God's victory brings peace. And, and so if we look at verse 3, and I'm, I'm trying to tie this up for you a bit. Verse 3, it says, 
There he broke the flashing arrows, the shields and the swords, the weapons of war, Selah. You know what? This is likely a reference to Jerusalem's beginning as Israel's capital. You see, a thousand years ago, or actually a thousand years before Christ, Jerusalem was occupied by a Canaanite tribe called the Jebusites. And let's, let's just go to 2 Samuel chapter 5. I want to show you something. 2 Samuel chapter 5. And we're going to look at verses 6 through 10. 2 Samuel chapter 5. Hallelujah. Verses 6 through 10. I don't want to lose my place in Psalms. Okay, here's what it says. It says, The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, You will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought, David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. On that day, David said, Anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That is why they say the blind and lame will not enter the palace. Then David took up residence in the fortress, and he called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the supporting terraces inward, and he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him, because God had pitched his tent in Salem, because God had established Zion, as his dwelling place, because God had given David victory over the Jebusites. That's why Jerusalem was the foundation of peace. I hope that makes sense to you. And so the city Jerusalem, meaning foundation of peace, it was captured via warfare. And the war was decided by God. Amen? I could talk more about that. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop there and keep going in Psalms. So in summary, God was known in Judah. He was not just known about, he was known. He was a friend to the Jewish nation. He was so committed to that friendship that he established his dwelling place among them in Jerusalem. And that was possible because God gave Israel the victory time and time again. And with that summary, I want to take a little bit of a detour. I want to go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 41. Isaiah, chapter 41. And so I hope you're following me today. This is going to be a little bit longer than usual, but that's okay. Because God's word is powerful. God's word does not go out void. Amen. God's word will accomplish God's purposes. So let's go to Isaiah, chapter 41. Isaiah, chapter 41. And we're going to look at verses 8 through 13. And I, I read a little bit of this earlier. It says, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, You are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear. For I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear. I will help you. Do not be afraid, O worm Jacob, O little Israel. For I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Wow, such a, a, a powerful passage of Scripture. What a promise. To the nation of Israel. And in this passage of Scripture, we see how God 
he intentionally chose Israel. He referred to them as a worm. They were just nothing. But God chose them. God tends to choose the nothings of this world. And he, he makes them something because of who he is. He stood by Israel. They're his covenant people. And today, in 2024, God is still standing by Israel. He is still their friend. And I feel sorry for any nation that is trying to wage war against Israel. They're going to die. They're going to perish. As that scripture says, they will be as nothing. Let's look at verses 4 through 6. Psalm chapter 76, verses 4 through 6. It says, You are resplendent with light, more majestic than mountains rich with game. Valiant men lie plundered. They sleep their last sleep. Not one of the warriors can lift his hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both horse and chariot lie still. You know, these verses, they, they describe the glorious appearance of God. His glory was greater than the majestic mountains of Israel. Today, here in Alaska, we, we would say His glory is greater than all the mountains of Alaska combined. The Brooks Range, the Alaska Range, the Talkeetna Mountains, the Kenai Mountains, the Wrangell Mountains, all combined fall way short of the glory of God. God's glory and stature, it overtakes all the armies of earth combined. The most valiant modern soldiers are helpless before Almighty God. A simple rebuke from God is all it takes to paralyze an army of horses and chariots. A simple rebuke from God is all it takes to silence a thousand F-16 fighter jets, a thousand T-14 battle tanks. God is great. And that's what these verses are saying. There's nothing that can compare to the glory of God, to his majesty, to his power. There's nothing on earth that can compare. Let's look at verses 7 through 9. You alone are to be feared. Who can stand before you when you are angry? From heaven you pronounced judgment, and the land feared and was quiet. When you, O God, rose up to judge, to save all the afflicted of the land. Selah. You know, that word selah means to ponder, to stop and think about it. And so, in these verses, Asaph is describing God as someone who should be feared. God's perfect judgment, His power to save, it should cause a holy awe to come upon us. Remember, this chapter started with God being known in Judah. But before you can know God, before you can be his friend, you have to fear him. And when I say fear, I don't mean you be scared of God. I mean have the utmost respect and, and, and a holy awe for who he is. Amen. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord. Is the beginning of knowledge. If you want to know God, you need to fear God first. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Do you want to know God today? Then start by fearing Him. Kneel before Him in humility. Amen. Tell Him how much you respect Him. Let's look at verses 10 through 12. Hallelujah. It says, Surely your wrath against men brings you praise. And the survivors of your wrath are restrained. Make vows to the Lord your God and fulfill them. Let all the neighboring lands bring gifts to the one to be feared. He breaks the spirit of rulers. He is feared by the kings of the earth. <clears throat> These final verses, they, they demonstrate the sovereignty of God. His will, God's perfect will, it trumps the will of man. That's good news. I'm glad that God's will takes precedence over the will of man. 
God is able to use the wrath of man to accomplish his will. When you look at things that have happened in history, God has used events to accomplish his will. Look, I mean, look, look at the, the Holocaust, for instance. And as awful as that was, you're, 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 you kind of say, well, how can God use something like that to accomplish his will? Well, we might not understand everything, but we certain, certainly know that God's will is, is going to prevail. And, you know, the nation of Israel, it, it came back into existence, I, I guess you could say, because of the Holocaust. Uh, or at least that was one of the things that was the, uh, that paved the way to Israel being recognized again, I think, in 1948. At the same time, God is able, and he often does, restrain or smolder the wrath of man. And so, certainly, man's wrath happens. But there's a lot of times where it doesn't happen because God squashes it before it has a chance. In either case, we can praise God. We can fear Him because all His ways are excellent. Amen. There's a song that says that all His ways are excellent. Excellent are His ways in all the earth. Do you trust God today? Hebrews chapter 11, we, we read about people of faith who experienced deliverance as God restrained the wrath of man. Amen? We, we read about Daniel in the lion's den. We read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. God restrained the wrath of man in those instances, and, and God's will prevailed. But then we also read in that same chapter about people of faith who died in their faith. They died as martyrs. They were victims of man's wrath. Nevertheless, their reward in heaven, their eternal reward, and the will of God, it remains. Matter of fact, let, let's turn to Romans chapter 8. Let, let's just read a, a couple of verses of Scripture here, and we're going to close. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And I'm, I'm going to read this from the Amplified. It says, We know with great confidence... That God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his plan and purpose. You know, that's a confidence-building verse right there. I'm going to read it one more time. This verse should build up your faith. It should build up your trust in God. It should cause you to, to just be elevated in your hope today. We know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his plan and purpose. You know, today you can rest assured that God is for you. He's for you. He's not against you. And with that in mind, you can relax. You, you can just... Relax in the peace of God, knowing that all things are being worked out to accomplish God's will in your life, including your salvation. Amen. This is a, just a powerful uh, promises of God right here. And so I hope uh, this causes your faith to just rise today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for for the word of God. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word causes faith to rise up in us. Lord, I think of what it says in the book of Romans, that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so as we listen to the word of God, not just me reading it, but Lord, as we hear it in our heart, as your spirit, Lord, speaks that word within our heart, that rhema word, God, I pray that it would just build up faith in those who are watching and listening today. I pray that God, their trust in you would be renewed, that their strength would be renewed as they wait upon you today, as they rest in you, as their confidence in you just stands firm. Lord, all your promises today are yes and amen. I thank you, Lord, that, that your will in our lives is, is, is the primary force that takes precedence over even our own will. And Lord, as we submit to your plan, as we submit to your lordship, we ask that your will be done in our lives. 
Use us to your glory, Almighty God. And today, Lord Jesus, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. You deserve it all today, Jesus. I thank you for the salvation that you've given us. I thank you for, for dying on the, on the cross for our sins, for setting us free from the penalty and the consequence of sin, tasting death for each of us. And Lord, may we live for you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you.